The following pre recorded program is sponsored by Adams Financial Concepts. Welcome to About Money, a different approach to investing you won't hear anywhere else. Your host, Mike Adams, is a registered investment advisor and works with investment portfolios exceeding over $100,000 in net worth and has a proven track record of managing long-term investments, surpassing the markets in the long term. The information shared in the following program is for educational purposes only, and any investment advice given may not be suitable for all investors. And now, here's Mike. Oh, it is Saturday, and we are talking about money. So did President Biden, when he delivered his message to Congress. We're going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about the programs. We're going to talk about why. We're going to talk about how he plans to pay for the programs. We're going to talk about how that's going to affect the economy. I also have a guest today that's going to be of interest. It is a nonprofit, so beware. I want to let you know about that. But it does give some insight into to living. So you want to hear what what she has to say? And we're going to finish up by talking about life and changes. So anyway, and especially as we go through, come out of this COVID time, talk about where we've been and where, where we're going. But I want to begin with the message that President Biden delivered before Congress because he discussed two programs the American Jobs Act or American Jobs Plan, which deals with infrastructure, both the physical in- infrastructure and our environment or our, our social instru- infrastructure. And he also talked about the American Family Plan. He announced how the administration plans to pay for them. So already having passed the COVID relief package, $1.9 trillion, He's talking about bringing two more proposals, $4 trillion. And he talked about how they were going to be paid for with new taxes on the wealthy and on corporations. What, what in, in fact, is going to be the, the impact of those investments on the economy? They're designed to make progress on four major issues. So let me talk about the four issues. And I've talked about these before. But let me talk about the four issues they're meant to address because they are four major issues that are facing the U.S. economy. Number one issue, and they're not in order of most important. It's just how I happen to take the notes for today. But the number one issue or the the first issue I want to talk about is income equality. Income equality prior to the pandemic which was accentuated even during the pandemic. There's been a a significant difference between what top executives companies receive and what people at the bottom receive. There's a significant difference between the top 1% and the bottom earners. Since 1980, if you look at the numbers, since 1980, and I'm a numbers guy, since 1980, GP has grown 79%. 79% 79% over those 40 years. That's roughly 2% per year, a little less than 2% a year. We've gone through some ups and downs since 1980. We went through the dot-com bust. We went through the through the Great Recession, and we've gone through the pandemic, But and those numbers aren't included. Prior to, to the pandemic, GDP had grown by 79% over those 40 years. But if you look at the after-tax earnings of the bottom half of the workers, they, their income has only grown by 20% over those years. Those 40 years, we see almost 40 years, have seen only a 20% growth in wages versus 79% for GDP. And if you look at the middle class, the after-tax earnings of the middle class have only increased 50% compared to 79% growth in GDP. You'd expect if everybody was getting the same, you'd see the same numbers for GDP as you would see for income levels. And that's the way it was between the end of World War II and 1973. But as the bottom workers got only 20%, the middle middle class got only 50%, the very wealthy increased 
420%. 420% while GDP was increasing just 79%. That's a significant difference and a significant difference income inequality. If you look at it in another way, from 1948 to 2017, productivity per capita increased by 248% during those years. Almost 50 years, productivity increased 248%. Every, every hour worked in 2017 delivered three times, almost three times, three and a half times the amount of output that it did in 1948. But income during that time only increased 115%. So there were reasons for that. Two-thirds of the other reason was due to the oil industries. We no longer had cheap oil. Oil became a big improvement over coal. And transportation grew dramatically. Think about airports. Think about airlines. Think about trucking. Think, think about the increased efficiency of Yale. And think about the increased emphasis on conservation. So oil had a significant impact on that change in productivity. But in 1973, while incomes had grown essentially equal with GDP at all levels, in 1973 it started to diverge. But it wasn't just income. Budget deficits soared, trade balances soared, saving rates tumbled, and the share of people from 25 to 29 living with their parents tripled. The number of children born to unmarried women skyrocketed. Childhood obesity quadrupled to over 20% of child children were obese. And health expenditures per capita increased 15 to 20 fold. So there's a question about income inequality that has to be addressed or truly needs to be addressed. It's a major issue. The second major issue is health care. We went through the, the whole thing with the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare. But when you look at where we are, the United States spends twice as much as any other nation on health care. When you add it all up, we spend twice as much. And yet if you look at infant mortality, out of the 36 developed countries, we rank only 33. And if you look at life expectancy out of those 36 countries, we're at 28. That means that 32 other countries have a lower infant mortality. And 27 countries have a longer life expectancy. We have 25 million people that are uninsured. 7.9% of the population and 40%, 46% are underinsured. And if anything, COVID highlighted it. The death rates for African Americans were two to three times Caucasian. It impacts all of us. Think about the, the workers who were on the first line. Not the medical people, but the grocery store clerks, the janitors, the cleaning people, the restaurant workers. The, and that included the bus drivers, and it included a lot of legal immigrants, you know, cleaning bedpans, washing and soiled sheets. Those were the low-income earners whose incomes have not maintained <clears throat> the same level as they were in 73. So there's an issue of bringing back health care. And COVID showed that. The third issue was the lifestyle. And we're already seeing people evaluate how they're spending money, but it goes beyond that. It goes to child care. You know, throughout the COVID, we saw men and women staying home to educate their children because the schools were closed. But over and above that, the cost of child care is keeping women out of the workforce, primarily women. If you look at the, the graphs, there's a number of women who cannot afford childcare because it's expensive and limited. So it's, it's easier for them to stay home rather than go to work. 
It reduces economic growth and child poverty. We see one out of six children are living in poverty. That's higher than all adults, and it's more prevalent with children of color. It's an impact. Illness, mental health problems, substance abuse, lower graduation rates, reduction in the labor market, it's an impact on the economy. And we've seen systemic racism really came into focus with the pandemic, the pr police brutality, but it goes way beyond police brutality, way beyond that. There's a systematic bias that plays out in the economy, and it's negative for the economy. Those are just some of the, the lifestyle issues that, that came out emphasized in the pandemic. We saw that, and we saw it to an extent. So those are the, the first three, and we're coming to commercial break. I will come back to the fourth one, and then I will talk about the impact of the proposals from the Biden administration, the taxes that are going to pay it, and how that's going to affect the economy. So don't go away. We've got a lot yet to cover. You want to hear my guest as well. And I want to come back to finish the program and talk about some of the changes that have happened over our lifetime that are also having an impact on where we are. So don't go away. If you miss any of this program or any of the other programs, you can find it on the podcast. We do a YouTube, and you can find the podcast on our website as well, adamsfinancialcontest.com. Stay with me. I'll be right back. About Money with Mike Adams on AM 1590, The Answer. For more information, click on Adams Financial Concepts. About Money continues. Remember the website, adamsfinancialconcepts.com. Here's Mike. So I've been talking about the Biden proposals and the issues they're, they're focused on addressing. I talked about income inequality. I talked about lifestyle changes. I've talked about health care. The fourth issue that is facing the country is maybe the biggest issue. It's climate change. And it really will come more and more into focus as we shift out of the pandemic. And it's one of those which is extremely costly if we do nothing. Estimates run as high as $170 trillion in damages if we do nothing. The number of forest fires, not just in the U.S., but around the world, the storms, the raising of sea levels, food shortages, and on and on and on, damages $170 trillion potential. And it's faded from sight somewhat with the virus, but it will be back as, as we conquer the, the pandemic, and it's going to be a significant issue as we go forward. It's... It is one, and it is part of what is being addressed in these, these three plans, the one that has already passed and the two that have been coming aside. So these are things that are coming forward that are being addressed, and they're being addressed by these three, three plans, the American Jobs Act, the American Family Plan. And they're being addressed, and not just by paying for debt. The $1.9 trillion was for the COVID relief plan was paid by debt. But the next two plans, the proposal is that they're paid for by taxes, taxes on the rich and taxes on corporations. And there's going to be a lot of pushback, and you're going to hear a lot of people talking about the collapse of the economy, the collapse of the stock market. Things are going to go from bad to worse, you know. We're hearing that already. We're going to see the pushback from the high net worth people who don't want to pay more taxes. We're going to see pushback from corporations who don't want to pay more taxes. And they're going to come up with all sorts of arguments. I'm a numbers guy. I just look at what we have to deal with in terms of that. And there's already people talking out, out there. They're the same people that or a lot of the same prognosticators were the people that said if Biden was elected and Trump wasn't elected, we would see the collapse in the stock market. 
you know what? After 100 days, during Trump's time, the market was up 9.1%. During Biden's time, it was up 9.9%. That was during the first 100 days. It's even higher at this point. It's because corporations have an inertia going forward. They, they focus on what they earned. It's not about the administration. It's not about who's president. And yes, some of that can affect what goes on, and certainly what's being proposed will have some impact on it. It's not going to wipe out 401ks. It's not going to wipe out the market. And in my opinion, I think it's going to be positive for the economy, and that's why I want to talk about it. I think there's going to be a lot of positives, some negatives as well, but I believe that in total, it's going to go through with or without Republican help, and it's going to be positive. Take the American Jobs Act. In fact, both are essentially wealth transfers, taking money from the corporations by raising taxes, and that money is going to build bridges, it's roads and highways. It's going to clean, clean drinking water. It's going to, to increase the electrical grid. There's going to be job training for the people that lose their jobs and need to find new, new jobs. And the idea is to fund projects where more labor is needed. It puts money in the hands of workers. It's taking money from corporations, moving it to the workers, because the workers will spend. The old idea is that if you leave the money in the corporations and they're going to raise workers' wages, we've seen since the 1973 that's not been the case. I mentioned the numbers from 1980 to 2019. While the GDP increased 79%, the middle income increased 50%, and the lowest, lowest income earners increased 20%. Even though corporations were doing very well, you see corporations are reflected at the 79%. The money didn't drift to the bottom. It drifted to the top. Because when you put money in the hands of the workers, what do they do? They go out and spend. And there's the old saying, the butcher pays, the baker pays, the candlestick maker. There's a multiplier effect. That's not 100% because governments are not efficient. We recognize that. But what we're seeing is that when money goes into the pockets of the lower income people, the middle class, that's, that goes into expenditures. We saw a very good example in 2017 with the, the tax cut, it was sold on the idea that lowering taxes would mean corporations would have more money, they would invest in structure, they would create more jobs, that would create more revenue, and that would pay for itself. The fact is, it increased company profits, it increased stock buybacks, it was good for shareholders and my clients, but it was a limited impact on the economy. And in total, when you increase the economy, eventually that comes through. So looking forward with the proposals that are coming, there's an estimated buyback value coming this year. It's estimated that stock buybacks will be $651 billion. That's not money flowing to the, the wage earners. That's flowing to shareholders. And while that's good for some of my clients, for a short-term impact, it's a one-year impact. It's not good for the long term. What we want to do is see the economy grow. And that's the proposal of taxing corporations, is to reduce the number of stock, of stock buybacks, to reduce the money that's being stockpiled, and move that money into the economy. I think it will have a significant impact. And yes, there will be some drawbacks and negatives because not all the money will go to, to the workers, but because it will be distributed by the government. But the biggest impact will be new spending. It will be the lower and middle income people who spend the money in the economy. They'll pay the butcher, they'll pay the baker, who pays the baker, who pays the candlestick maker. The American Family Plan, it's almost like Robin Hood, taking from the rich and giving to the poor or the middle class. And the idea is to take money from those who are earning over 400000 
increasing capital gains tax and distribute that money as well through programs to the lower earning people. And it distributes it to childcare, it distributes it to, to education, to schools. It's going to be a significant increase, in my opinion, of the economy. It won't be 100%, but even if it's the impact is 75%, it will be excellent for the economy. And when it's excellent for the economy, we will see company revenues grow, we will see profits grow, and the impact will be a positive for the economy. That's my very best guess, and I think that I'm going to be correct on that. I think even the stock market, even though it's going through the ups and downs, they see it as well. It is. I think one where there will be positive impacts on certain companies, a few companies will be, get left behind and it will be negative, but the idea is to pick the right companies and be in the right companies in our stock portfolios. Yeah, there'll be companies that lose and companies who win. The best idea is to be in those companies that win and out of the losers. That's, that's the impact of what's going on. I think it's positive for this year. I think it's positive for next year and for the next five years probably, and maybe beyond that. That's my take. So I want to stop here. I want to introduce my guest today who's got a great story to tell. My guest today is Heidi Will, the Executive Director of PAWS. Welcome to the program, Heidi. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be with you today, Mike. So, Heidi, let's start with your background. Tell us about your background before you got to PAWS, and then we'll talk about PAWS. Okay. I have a 25-year history in the public sector, and as a nonprofit leader, uh, before PAWS, I was the director of a nonprofit in Seattle focused on youth development called the First T. And I've been a major donor of PAWS for 20 years, so I jumped at the chance to lead such a well-respected and effective organization. I started just over a year ago, just in time for the pandemic. <laughs> Great timing. <laughs> it is, it's definitely been interesting, for sure. <laughs> so you've got quite a background in public service. Um, and so PAWS seemed very appropriate. So tell us about PAWS. Most, most of us know PAWS as where you can get a dog or a cat and you take care of that, but it goes way beyond that. Tell us about it. Yes, uh, PAWS started just over 54 years ago in Linwood um, as an organization uh, interested in animal welfare, um, at that time helping um, homeless cats and dogs find homes. And it grew from there to also help um, injured and orphaned wildlife. Uh, we officially opened a wildlife rehabilitation center in 1989. And then the third leg of the stool is our education team, which is working with youth primarily, but all people to inspire compassionate action for animals. So let's talk about the wild animal side, something that, that I never knew about. So give us a quick brief introduction because we're coming to a commercial break. Give us a very brief thing and then we'll come back okay. after the break and talk about it in more detail. Sure. PAWS is the largest wildlife hospital in Washington State. We serve about 5,000 patients per year, representing about 270 different species, everything from black bears to hummingbirds to harbor seals uh, to bobcats, um, to even an albatross was in our care last year. So we help all animals in need. That's it's an amazing story in part that I'd never understood about PAWS before. We're going to come back and hear more about that from Heidi right after the commercial break. About Money with Mike Adams on AM 1590, The Answer. For more information, click on Adams Financial Concepts. About Money with Mike Adams on AM 1590, The Answer. For more information, click on AdamsFinancialConcepts.com. So I'm here with Heidi Wills, who's the Executive Director of PAWS. We started talking about the wild animal farm 
portion of pause. So I want to return there, and I want to hear more about it in greater detail. Heidi. Yes, Mike. Um, so, so pause um, helps um, wildlife, as I had mentioned earlier, about 5,000 animals per year. We also adopt out homeless dogs and cats, about 4,000 per year. Um, and many people don't realize that about a million and a half healthy dogs and cats across the country are euthanized every year. Um, so it, it's still a major issue that we need to inform folks of the, the importance of spay and neuter laws, but we've got a handle on that in this community. So PAWS transports animals in from areas outside of the Puget Sound region and finds loving homes for those animals, um, literally saving their lives and giving them a second chance. That's that's awesome and great. But I do want to talk about the 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 wild animal portion. Okay. Uh, you mentioned 5,000 wild animals. That's that's part I didn't understand before. Everything yep. from black bears to to hummingbirds. Give us a couple yes. of examples of of what you do. Yes, you know, um, even just uh, very recently, we will be releasing uh, twin bears, black bears, that came to pause about 15 months ago at six ounces each. Uh, their den had been accidentally disturbed, and their mother did not come back, so they certainly would have perished if it weren't for paws. Uh, they were brought in by... Um, some officials from the Washington State Department of Fish and Wildlife, and we have been caring for them um, for the last 15 months. Uh, we want to keep wild animals wild, so they did never they never interfaced with humans. We even fed them uh, wearing bear outfits when they were very, very young um, so that they wouldn't associate humans with food um, so that they can have a successful reintroduction back into the wild. And this next week, we will be releasing them. They are now 150 pounds each and very healthy and will live hopefully uh, normal and ha happy lives back in the wild where they belong. And so... They never get the human contact at all. That's right. That's right. Um, another success story very recently is a golden eagle came into our care. It um, had been found in uh, a river next to a freeway near, near Twisp, and a uh, passerby rescued that animal and brought it to pause. It had deep muscle trauma and a blood infection. Uh, we think that it had been hit by a vehicle. Uh, it had a blood transfusion from another healthy uh, bald eagle that was in, in care at that time. And after nine months, it is successfully rehabilitated. And we released it back into the wild on Sunday. It's um, also been banded so that we can keep track of how it's doing. And it has uh, since release flown over 100 miles. So another wonderful success story. It's a wonderful thing that you're doing. I mean, at a time when we're expanding and taking areas of the country for building homes, we still have to preserve the wildlife. And, you know, it's a, it's a part of Paz I never understood or never heard. So I think that's great. So yes. let's talk about the, the adoption program, too. Okay. When someone comes, when someone comes to adopt an animal, What's the process? Well, we changed our process due to the pandemic. It, we used to have an open shelter where, where people could come in at any time and find the right fit for them uh, to go home with a dog or cat. And since that time, we've changed to an appointment-only process um, so that we could help limit the numbers of people inside our facility at one time. Uh, we'll be looking to move back in, in June uh, to allow more people in our facility um, as our community is getting a hold of, of the pandemic. Uh, so hopefully that will mean that more dogs and cats will find loving families. If people are interested in adopting a dog or cat, they can go onto our website, paws.org, and there's two different tracks. If they already know the animal that they're interested in, we have um, photos and we have uh, paragraph descriptions of those animals, and they can fill out the form and indicate which animal they're interested in and, 
and otherwise, if they just know they want a, a medium-sized dog, for example, um, then they can fill out a separate form and let us know what they're interested in, and a member of our staff will contact them and find out what their situation is so that we can find the right fit for them. That's awesome. And I would imagine during this COVID time, there were a number of people that felt that they really would benefit from a pet. Yes, we, we learned through um, social isolation just the value and the importance that the warmth and comfort and unconditional love that a companion animal can bring to, to a person who, you know, was perhaps not interfacing with as many members of the, the community as they might have otherwise. So it was a really important time for PAWS to step up and be there for the community and adopt out these dogs and cats um, that, you know, have been a saving grace um, for a lot of families. You know, one thing I know is my granddaughter has been taking care of kittens. She's not in this area. She's in California, but she gets kittens that are newly born and she becomes a foster parent to these little kittens for six weeks or so. Yep. You, you must have a program like that as well. Yes, we, we could not do the work we do without foster families. We have about 450 foster families right now, uh, but we need more. Only about one-third of those families are actively taking in animals. Uh, we have animals that have medical conditions where they've maybe just gone through surgery and they need some time to recuperate before they're adoptable. We have moms with their puppies or their kittens um, where we want to keep that family together and, and while those babies grow strong and healthy for adoption. So we need families to take them in um, and sometimes we get more animals than we have kennels in our facilities and we don't want to say no to those transfers like I said otherwise those animals would not have a second chance so we need foster families to help be there um, as a safety net for these um, animals giving them love and comfort and care and helping to socialize them so that they are, become even um, more equipped to give love to to a family so if people are interested in volunteering for PAWS, one of the best ways they can do that is to serve as a foster family. And there's information about that under the volunteer section on our website. So I want to talk about the third aspect, and that's the educational portion, because you're working with a number of students as well, correct? Yes, we, we reach about 7,000 young people through partnerships with area schools, teaching them about compassionate action towards animals that they can take, such as um, spaying and neutering their pets or keeping their cats inside, um, which otherwise can cause harm to native bird life. These kinds of important issues are discussed uh, among fifth grade classrooms and, and younger in our community. So, PAWS itself, how is it financed? Yes, yeah, so um, all of PAWS, uh, our budget is financed through the generosity of individuals and foundations. Uh, we would not be able to do the work we do without the support from the community, and we're very fortunate to be in a community that cares so deeply about animals. That's awesome. So, yes. you have a couple benefits as well. Tell us about those. Yes, so we've, we've had to pivot due to the pandemic. Um, so our two major fundraising events that we have each year are now virtual. Um, we have Pause Walk, um, which is normally a 5K at um, Magnuson Park. And instead this year, it will be a three-week virtual event starting May 23rd and it will go through June 2nd. And people can raise funds on their fundraising page like a walkathon, but also we have sponsors who are sponsoring people to walk. So even if they don't raise funds in that way, just by walking, they will raise a dollar per mile for the programs at PAWS. The other event that we have is PAWS Wild Night, and that's a virtual auction that will take place on August, or October 9th, and that's where we have auction items and a paddle raise to help um, fund the programs at PAWS. That's awesome. So tell people how they can get involved, either as a volunteer, as a donor, 
as a supporter for PAUSE? Okay, the, the simplest way to help is by shopping. So p people can select PAUSE for their Amazon Smile account and for their Fred Meyer account. Um, that raises funds for, for PAUSE with, without even blinking. Um, we have two major fundraisers each year, as I had mentioned, the Paws Walk and the Paws Wild Night. Um, we have volunteer support. We could not do what we do without volunteers. Um, we welcome work groups to help with projects on our campus. We particularly need help with maintaining our dog trails. Um, I had mentioned earlier we need foster families, especially now in busy baby season. And all of this um, is mentioned on the volunteer section of our website. I had it, Heidi. It's an incredible program. Pause is. Thank you for being on, and thank you for all this. And say one more time the website for people. Yes, thank you. Pause can be found at Pause P A W S, which stands for Progressive Animal Welfare Society. Pause dot org. Thank you for being on. And oh, for the my listeners, thanks for having me. For the listeners. Do get involved. It's a really worthwhile organization. It does so much. It does so very much. About Money with Mike Adams on AM 1590, The Answer. For more information, click on Adams Financial Concepts. About Money continues. Remember the website, adamsfinancialconcepts.com. Here's Mike. So when I was growing up, and I've been around for quite a while, since I was growing up in the 50s and 60s and 70s, and when I was growing up, I had a friend whose mother had a, what, today we would call a nervous breakdown. And she went to the doctor and the doctor prescribed to take care of her nerves that she should take up smoking. You know, even though the tobacco companies knew that it was life threatening, they didn't publish that information. And that was a recommendation at that time for a nervous breakdown to take up smoking. I can remember times when meat was good, times when meat has been bad. Going way back, you know, Earth, the Earth was the center of the universe. And you probably remember, it hasn't been that long ago that the Internet connection was a dial-up. Remember that? How slow it was? And what about chemistry? Remember going through high school? High school in the 1970s, there were 106 elements. You know, that was the periodic table. You know, today there's over 118. You know, that's more than 10% of new elements that have been found in the last 40-some years. Facts change. Knowledge changes. There's a book out that's called The Half-Life of Facts, Why Everything Has an Ex Expiration Date by Samuel Arbison. And as I read the book, it brought a lot of things to mind, things that have an impact on investments, on investments and on the economy. You know, and they use a mathematical description to describe what's happening. Most of us, most of us think of our lives as just linear, a straight line that continues. And, you know, prior to the pandemic, <clears throat> I had a GPS that would take me on a route. It was a line, it drew the line, it went straight, and our lives tend to be that way, in a straight line. But the fact is, it isn't always that way. I use the explanation sometimes of explaining what happens, the classic problem. If you give somebody a job for $1,000 a day, would they choose that, or would they take one penny that would and that amount would double every single day. So the first day they would make a penny, the second day two pennies, the next day four pennies, the next day eight pennies. Which would they take? And a lot of people would take $1,000 a day. But you know what? That one penny doubling every single day, by the end of the 30th day, the total payment is over $10 million. But if you look at it, 
five million comes on the last day. Half of it on the last day. 75%, seven and a half million comes on the last two days. And 90% of that on the last four days. So it's a curve. If you're looking at a mathematical curve, it's not a straight line. It's a curve that looks like it has a knuckle in it where it suddenly takes off and goes. That's how information and knowledge and facts are. You know, we talk about nuclear and how it has a half-life. Well, if you use the same half-life analogy, what you find is knowledge is doubling every, every X number of years. In medicine, <laughs> in medicine, it's doubling every 87 years. In genetics, it's doubling every 32 years. In chemistry, every 35 years. The information that we learned 35 years about 35 years ago about genetics was only half of what we know today, and maybe it's even doubling even faster. But scientists, of all the scientists that ever lived, of all, if you go back to the beginning of time, or at least most of the last 300 years, 80% of the scientists who ever lived are alive today. And everything is not equal as well. You know, you think of some of the companies that have grown, some of the, the movies that have grown, some of the things that have happened over the lifetime. Think about what we've seen in our lifetime. Think of where we've been and what's happened in our lifetime. <clears throat> you know, just think about the technology changes. You know, when I was growing up, we got a black and white TV set. It had three channels. You had an antenna. To get up to change channels, you had to get up and turn a knob on the TV. And a 21-inch screen was huge. Most people had 18 or 12-inch screens. 21 was huge. And then we got a color TV. Still had three channels. Still you needed an antenna, although in some places they were getting cable. But there was no remote, and the TV actually got larger. It was 24, seven, 24 inches. And then came five or six channels and cable and a remote. And if you are old enough to remember the beginning remotes, those clickers, click, 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 and the TVs got larger, 27 inches. And then TVs got even larger, and the remotes got even better, and the cable came, and you got more channels and more channels, and then they became flat and smaller in diameter. That was the TV. Think of how things have changed in just your lifetime and my lifetime. You know, McKinstry did a study and said that leadership companies are changing three times faster today than they did 30 years ago. You know, that's had an impact on what we do with investing. There was a time in which you could buy a stock, put it in a drawer, and hold it forever. And if the company existed during that time, it only got better and better. But today, according to Richard Foster, who did the study at Yale, the average life of companies in the Standard & Poor's in 1920 was 70 years. Today, it's less than 15 years. And think of how much they've, they've increased and how rapid the increase in revenues is happening. It took Microsoft 14 years to go from zero revenues to one billion. It took eBay and Facebook seven years to go from zero to one billion. It took Zynga four years to go from zero to one billion. Remember Zynga? Remember Farmville? Part of the Farmville where you can buy animals? Zynga? was selling 5,000 tractors a day on their game of Farmville, 5,000 tractors. That's as, as many as John Deere sells in a year. And they were selling these on the Internet. They were not real tractors, but they were selling all these tractors. And Zynga is an example of, of a company that ramps up very quickly and then comes falling down. So and maybe they're on their way back again to $1 billion in revenues. But that's how fast things are changing. 
it's no longer a case that you can buy and hold and stick things in the drawer forever, but there are companies that continue to grow over a number of years. So it's not buy and hold forever, but it can be a buy and hold. It's not a trading kind of philosophy, but a find great companies and invest in great companies. That's where the, the market is going, and that's where things are going, and that's what we try to do at Adams Financial Concepts. We try to find those great companies and put them into our portfolios, and hopefully they work out. Facts are changing. Knowledge is changing. Technology is changing. Demographics are changing. Lifestyles are changing. The idea is to be ahead of the curve instead of behind the curve. And I'm hoping that when you're listening to this program, you're learning information that puts you ahead of the curve instead of behind the curve. I'm hoping you're getting information that's, that's positive and giving you direction, not where we have been, but where we're going. And that wraps us up for today. Have a very wonderful weekend, and have a wonderful week. This is Mike Adams, and join me next Saturday to talk about money. listening to About Money with Mike Adams, a registered investment advisor. If you'd like more information about what you heard today or about Mike's investment philosophy and strategy, or if you'd like Mike to evaluate your own portfolio, click on adamsfinancialconcepts.com. That's adamsfinancialconcepts.com. The information shared in the preceding program was for educational purposes only, and any investment advice given may not be suitable for all investors. Join us again next Saturday at noon for more About Money with Mike Adams here on AM 1590. The answer. The preceding program was sponsored by Adams Financial.